folks welcome back um today for us what we've got is we've got a uh, little bit of cleanup on some of uh, yesterday's topics and tuesday's topics um basically uh, way of labeling and um run through some software type stuff for you just so that you get another chance how to do that uh, and then i'm going to talk you through interference um interference um with basically just our transverse waves right now um quiz tomorrow uh wave parts like labeling the transverse and longitudinal wave uh wave speed calculating how fast uh wave goes also how uh what each part kind of means and stuff like that uh and then uh, Doppler concept and also calculation for us um i will have office hours tomorrow before school i'm not going to do them today after school um just because uh, I got to figure out how to use the WebEx stuff. So, uh, otherwise, uh, here we go. All right. So, some quick review. Uh, transverse waves. Now, um, in seeing all your drawings and stuff like that, you did a great job with crest. You did a great job with trough. Uh, your wavelengths at times were a little bit sketchy. What I mean by that is, if you look at this wavelength here, what you're going to see is this goes from the crest to the crest. It also could go from the trough to the trough. It has to be same point to same point. Some of us drew it down here in the middle of the wave, and we just said, oh, okay, it's the width of this trough at this point, or it's the height of the crest at this point. No, it has to be that exact same point, meaning as this point crosses up here, going upwards, it also would be the same as right there as well, right? On here now, you can see the amplitude. That's just the size of the wave. Um, we're not gonna make too huge of a deal out of, out of the amplitude of it. And also then the equilibrium is just a flat point. Um, so if you walked out you know, in the morning and, and found a perfectly calm, still glass-like lake, that'd be considered equilibrium. Um, then all of a sudden boats start running on it and you start seeing crests, you start seeing troughs, all right? Uh, longitudinal waves. Um, compression uh, is the area where it's squeezed. Rarefaction is the area where it's wider open, right? Um, now, yes, this does look a little bit like a transverse wave for us. Um, what you'll probably likely see on the quiz tomorrow is that we'll do probably a group of dots or something, right? So the area where the dots are really, really tightly packed, that's where you're going to see that area of Compression, um, where there are very few dots, if any dots, that's where that rarefaction is. Uh, wavelength again on a longitudinal wave is same point, same point. So it's the middle of that compression to the middle of that compression. It could be the end of the compression to the end of the compression. It could be the middle of the rarefaction to the middle of the rarefaction. It is the same point, same point. All right. Don't get caught up when you look at this one and say, oh, it's the middle. Of the compression to the middle of the compression. That be the case for us. Right? Uh, Doppler effect depth. Uh, found this nice little graphic online. Um, hopefully, this will help to clarify a few things for us with this. Um, when we look at the concept of Doppler effect, really the terminology that we're looking for is smaller wavelength, or I'm sorry, smaller or higher, right? Lower or higher. Okay? So if we look at the effect of the Doppler effect on the person in the blue shirt, uh, as that police car is moving towards that person, meaning they're moving from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, that's the way the police car is moving, they're going to experience a smaller wavelength, um, a higher frequency, a higher pitch, and the one thing that won't change is the wave speed. Uh, the reason that the wave speed won't change is because you're going to see that this thing is going through the same temperature of air, um, whether it's the person in the red dress or the person in the blue shirt, right? Um, the smaller wavelength, the waves just get closer and closer and closer to the wave frequency. Higher frequency, um, that just means that there's going to be wave, more waves per second hitting this person's ears um, than previously thought. Um, the higher pitch is just because of that higher frequency, you're going to hear it be a lot, lot higher. Um, again, if, uh, if you listen to a guitar, you listen to a piano, um, the higher the note you're playing, uh, the higher the frequency that that's going to be played at. Okay? 
Um, if we look at the red dress, um, what's happening here is the wavelength is getting longer, um, the frequency is getting lower, um, and the pitch is getting lower. Um, longer wavelength means that the waves are just going to spread out. Right? Lower frequency means that the amount of hertz, oscillations per second, waves per second, is just going to get lower. Lower pitch because of that lower frequency. Right? Um, this would be a very low note. Okay? Um, it's not going to vibrate that that strain on that piano very much. Um, we're at a very, sorry, at a very high frequency for us. So, and again, wave speed still the same, right? Just because we're talking about this thing running through air for us. Okay, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense there. All right, Doppler effect. Okay, so uh, while standing near a railroad crossing, a person hears a distance. Uh, according to the train's engineer, the frequency emitted by the horn is 403 hertz. The train is traveling at 20 meters per second at the speed of the sound of 46 meters per second. Okay? So, question we want to know, uh, what would be the adjusted frequency of the train's horn if the train was at rest? Okay? So not moving. Um, what is the adjusted frequency that reaches the bystander once the train is approaching the crossing? All right, so let's look at each one individually. All right, so here's how we're going to dump our data into there. All right, while standing near a railroad crossing, okay, we've got the frequency emitted by the horn is 440. That's our original, right? Um, then what we're going to see is that the velocity that this thing is traveling at, or the sound wave is traveling at, is 346. Right? The velocity of the source is zero. The velocity of the observer is also zero. The reason why um, in this first one, those two are zero is because the train's at rest. Right? So what we see here is um, we see that we get 346 plus zero, 346 minus zero, that's just 346. Um, divide those two and you get one. Right? So the perceived frequency or the changed frequency um, is going to be 440 hertz, which should make sense if it's just at rest, right? Um, so if you're just standing next to it and it blows that train whistle, then you're going to hear it be the same frequency throughout time. Okay? Same frequency, same thing. All right, so if it's moving now, all right, so if it's moving, um, original frequency or the actual frequency is 440. Our velocity is still 346. Now the source is moving 20 meters per second. All right. Um, and again, it's moving towards us. Right. So because it's moving towards us, that's going to stay positive. All right. Uh, our initial velocity, or our velocity, I should say, of the observer is also zero. Okay? So what we see then is we're going to take uh, 346 and add 20 to it. Right, because it's coming towards us at 20 meters per second. All right, R is still going to be zero. Excuse me, we end up seeing that this is going to be 366 on top divided by 346. That's 1.06. That's like 0 0.057 or some numbers after it. Multiply it by 440. And what we find out is uh, that our perceived frequency or the frequency that we're going to hear is going to be 467 hertz. Um, again, if you're struggling with that or have questions with that, reach out, let me know. Um, like I said before, we can have, I, I can throw together a meeting or something like that. There, yeah. All right, interference on waves. Interference of waves is when um, two waves interact with each other. Constructive interference, as you see on the left, is when we hit same point with same point. So what you're hopefully noticing here is that this wave is perfectly in phase with the bottom wave. What that means is the crest is at the same point the crest is, the trough is at the same point the trough is. So what happens is, is that you get these two waves that will then add together. The crest will get higher, the trough will get lower when they meet up perfectly in sync like this. Now, um, other people will call this superposition. Um, I've heard of it both ways. Okay? So just be aware of that. Destructive is when they're out of phase, so to speak. What that means is, if you look, you see that this one on the top, its crest is being met by 
the trough on that one. Now, with these two being perfectly similar, but just off a little bit, what you're going to see is that the result of that is that you get a flat line. You get no wave, right? They just cancel each other out. Okay. Um, another example, if we've got two waves moving towards each other, like on the left here, A and B, and they both meet crest to crest, well, they're going to get larger. Now, again, this is two-dimensional. So please be aware of that. All right, in the three-dimensional world, it does change a little bit. Um, the, the physics get a little bit messier, so to speak. Um, but um, in this two-dimensional look, or even if we just had a spring that we were using to create this with, which I'll do tomorrow in lab, um, you're going to see that on this left side, the constructive version of this thing is that they're going to meet up and get going. Okay? On the right side, what you're seeing, a crest is going to meet a trough. As long as that crest's amplitude and that trough's amplitude, the height and the depth of them are the same, then the result is going to be canceled. Nothing, right? Um, and again, there's, there's reasons we want constructive interference, and there's reasons we want destructive interference. Um, I was watching a wakeboarding event um, a number of years ago, and um, they would make one run down, one run back, and when they came back, they had the the people who were wakeboarding had one opportunity at the end to do what was called a double up. Basically, what happened was is the wake from the boats hit each other, and what they did is if they timed it right, they got this huge wave that they were able to do crazy, ridiculous tricks off of. Right, that was a positive, right? Destructive interference, right? If we want to start to cancel out those waves, we would like to obviously have happen. Okay? So if we're looking at a wave pool or something like that, and we want to cancel out those waves, all of a sudden we can get that maybe going. Okay. All right. So like I said, uh, constructive interference, two waves with identical frequencies in phase, crest to crest, trough to trough. All right. Destructive. Two waves with identical frequencies, but they're 100, 180 degrees out of phase. Now, you don't have to worry about the angle measurement of that or, the, or anything like that. Just the big thing to remember when we talk about destructive interference is that we're going to see these meeting at opposite points, so to speak. All right. The easiest one is the transverse, just because you can visibly see how on the left side when they meet, they basically double or get larger. On the right side, when they meet out of phase, they cancel each other out. Again, this is probably why some people will call it superposition, because it allows you to see how, you know, how those two waves interact. And because of the way that they interact, um, you can see either they're getting larger or smaller, so to speak. Okay? Here's kind of an animation that I found that was pretty interesting. Um, you can see both waves are pretty similar in size. All right, as we see those two being similar in size, what we're going to see is that the bottom wave is moving. As it moves into perfect position, you get constructive interference. As it moves into that out of phase or 180 degrees difference, then you get destructive interference. All right? So it gives you a nice kind of transitionary look at how this can happen. Right? And if you've ever been. Um, if you ever been on a lake behind a boat um, and you had a dead like I did, um, who was really, really good at finding constructive interference. For my dad being a principal, being an elementary ed teacher as well, um, man, he knew how to spot the physics of the world. Um, I very vividly remember um, him getting me outside the wake of the boat, sitting on a tube, and all of a sudden seeing this hodgepodge of waves doing this, you know, big crest, no crest, big crest, no crest, big crest, no crest. And he had the ability to take that boat and turn it in such a way that he could direct me on the tube <laughs> right into the back. Um, if you didn't notice on the first clip, basically that's what happened to me, right? I hit the big crest of that, in, the, of that constructive interference, and now I, I learned how to fly real quick, all right? Um, and I imagine that some of us have gone through that as well. Um, hopefully, you know, 
no ill effects of that interaction. Okay. All right. So just to sum it up in words for you, constructive two wave amplitudes will add together, whether that's the height of the crest or the depth of the trough. Okay. Destructive, the two waves will tend to cancel each other out. Again, their amplitude, if their amplitudes are equal, you'll see a flat surface there. All right. Meaning that they would they would cancel each other out perfectly. All right. So that's interference for us. Now, um, rest of the day stuff for you. Um, get notes ready um, so that you can take that quiz tomorrow. Um, I've got here um, a little bit more of a challenging railroad Doppler effect problem. All right. Um, you won't see one like this on the test. You'll see one like you saw earlier in the class and also on yesterday's homework. Um, I'll make sure that it's a clean copy for you, not with any issues where we had observer, and, you know, and um, the source moving, but then trying to calculate them or stationary. That was one of my issues. Okay. Um, so check this one out. You can see the answer on the bottom of the screen there. Um, and then I got an interesting video for you. Um, this one's about some rogue waves that are out there and the science behind it a little bit. Um, it's it is a little bit slow at first but i promise you it gets pretty darn crazy at the end um and again um another one of my list of reasons why i don't want to go in the ocean obviously because of rogue waves but yeah i know i know what you're gonna say rogue waves yeah that's not that scary huh just wait until you see the video and see some of those waves on there all right um but that's your homework for the day um try out the problem on the left and uh, check out that uh, video on waves. Also on my YouTube channel, I've got uh, another one on there by uh, Science Girl, I think her name is, or that's her handle that she's using. Um, check her out, she does a nice job too, okay? Um, otherwise, um, hope you have a great day. Um, if you got questions, email me. Um, otherwise, uh, I will have office hours tomorrow. I'll put that together in an email for us um, once I figure out how to do that as well, okay? Um, take care. See you tomorrow.